All right. Well, I would love to say this was our first episode uh, back recording together, but this is actually our second uh, show in a row where we're going to be talking about the same things over again, but it's okay because it's a lot to talk about. So, um, the hell of the <laughs> yeah, welcome to the show. I'm JML, and my co host is Charlie Marone. Charlie Marone, there's no aliases, nothing you want to be called. You're okay with the government name? I'm okay with the government name. Okay. I'm not. I get stalkers. So, <laughs> well, this is our our new um, network um, that I put together, and uh, Charlie and I, we actually have uh, we've done this before um, in the past, um, sporadically uh, with different shows, and we always had uh, tons of fun doing them. And he actually he connected with me was it last week about yeah. it and uh i told him you know i'm putting together a network and a platform for different shows and uh i have time he has time so we're gonna make as much content as we possibly can over the next uh couple months and see where we go from there um i created a patreon page for the network which will be in our youtube description uh you can click the link um we have two different tiers we have the keep the lights on tier which helps support us uh, as a network and then uh, we have the vip tier which uh will definitely uh there's some good benefits where you can co-host a show and you can actually pick whatever topic that you want to talk about um yeah so different things uh we have going on um Want to show the people what they could win? Yeah. Snap into a Funko Pop. Oh, yeah. Uh, So right now we're around 90 subscribers, which is (laughs) it's pretty cool considering uh, we don't have a single video up yet at all. Um, (laughs) So that's pretty uh, it's pretty awesome. It speaks to the amount of support. I've gotten through uh, different channels, um, card breakers, um, like my man, Run Good Life, um, Shy City Pulls, um, Hitman Rips, etc. In that community, um, so it's been awesome uh, connecting with them, and uh, hope to have them on the channels uh, for our sports shows and breaking shows. Um, yeah um so 200 200 subscribers 300 unique comments um we will raffle off that macho man through a youtube comment picker um yeah so that, i mean that's probably like a 30 to 40 dollar pop now that's so when i bought it it was like 15 but i know i think that one's retired so as soon as they get retired their value goes up I mean, you used to be the Funko guy. You could you could probably speak to that better. Yeah, I used to. You 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 know, I used to have well over maybe three hundred pops. Uh, <laughs> that was a wild time. Um, yeah, once they get retired, they go up in value. Uh, slowly go up in value. Some skyrocket, but I think a pop like that, thirty, forty, forty-five. Yeah. I um I right now so yeah I don't really buy that many pops um I did actually buy last year all of the boys pops from the TV show um those are pretty cool but yeah no we need uh we, we would love the support and the more you guys support us the more uh giveaways that I'll do and give back to the community so you know that that's what I'm here for, and I like to get giveaways. Right? <laughs> Even though I make fun of the people that ask for giveaways, giveaways are always cool. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is our our wrestling show. Uh, it's called the Chamber Pod, and I also add on from parts unknown because um, you don't know where we're airing this show from. So uh, without further ado, there's been some major, major. Uh, 
wrestling news behind the scenes. Vince McMahon uh, stepped down as CEO temporarily, in quotation marks. And uh, at first, when he stepped down, I'm like, oh, well, Nick Khan's going to take over because obviously Stephanie just stepped aside to take a leave of absence. But lo and behold, Stephanie is now the interim CEO. How do you think this played out, Charlie? Like, 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 did you think that Stephanie kind of knew this was coming, wanted to take some time off, but didn't think it was going to come this quick and then had to scramble back to work? If she wanted to take time off, I doubt she knew this was, this was happening, that she would be next in line. Um, it probably took her by surprise, but she jumped at the moment and here we are. Yeah, a couple a couple things that we actually didn't talk about last show that uh, they come to my mind now. So I'm glad that we're actually recording this again. Is um, the 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 real shocker, or I, I guess shocker to me was apparently Linda and Vince haven't been together for quite a long time. Yeah, like they've been I, separated. Yep. So, I mean, that's news to me because um, it, by all accounts, I, I figured that they were still married. So technically, if they're separated, this wasn't an affair. So where the... They ever, ever came together for her political career. Yeah. Then, you know, you have Nick Khan sitting there probably like, what did I do wrong? I should probably be the CEO at this point because hate him or not, every decision he's made for the most part has been right on the news when it comes to making money and making a profit for WWE and, and the shareholders. Um, like, how do you think he feels, Charlie? I don't know enough about Nick Khan to... I, I don't know him from whoever. Yeah, well... And this really would, would be insignificant. He's made a lot of the big money deals for them. Um, expanding their reach with different markets. Um, trying to get WWE out there in bigger venues. Which, the only time it's failed so far is uh, Money in the Bank that had to get moved from uh, Allegiant Stadium to, I think, MGM. Um, there was no way they were going to sell out Allegiant Stadium. I mean, that thing holds like eighty to 90,000 people. Like, Money in the Bank will never draw that much. Yeah. Um, unless you had, the like, The Rock. Like, if you had The Rock coming back to do a Money in the Bank, you probably could sell out Legion Stadium. But if you didn't have that in the cards, booking Money in the Bank for that sized venue, it just was never going to work to begin with, with how the roster is right now, how it's constructed. Um, so getting back to Vince, uh, John Laronitis is involved, apparently. Won't uh, be from... No. Well, apparently the woman... Um, that this suit was, you know, they brought up the suit with it. She was getting paid like a hundred grand a year. Then all of a sudden she was making 200 grand a year. And then she was making, you know, more money. And she had carried out an affair with Vince and people behind the scenes. One of them being John Laronitis, who is married to Mama Bella, which, uh, you know, God knows how the working relationship is going to be with the Bellas in WWE now, knowing that Vince knew, obviously, that this was going on. And, you know, it's just, I'd laugh. It is a sad state of affairs because uh, a lot of people's lives are involved in this. And, you know, you obviously have children involved and grand grandchildren. And, you know, it's a real black eye if these allegations are true, which certainly. You know, you know, you're innocent until proven guilty, but it's just a really sad state of affairs. 
going back to, you know, immediately this all this news comes out on Friday. And then Vince books himself on the opening segment of SmackDown. Now, I tuned in, but I had very low expectations knowing that this is a legal matter. So I, I had like a point. Five percent feeling that he was going to say anything about that. So Charlie sends me a text like, "What the fuck was that?" And I'm like, "Well, that's typical Vince. He's the ultimate promoter. He's just there to pop a rating." And he came out and did the uh, the whole. You you say it, Charlie. You say it better than me. He came out and he says, "Then now forever together." Uh, welcome to Friday Night SmackDown. Which is just reiterating the whole opening signature that we just saw five seconds before he came out. So, I mean, I'm not expecting him to go verbatim over the trial and everything that he's going through, but give us something <laughs> other than that, for Christ's sake. Yeah, it's a, it's a real interesting um, conundrum because I remember... When Vince spoke too soon in June of 2007 with the whole Benoit situation and they did a tribute show. So I I just think he's just like, man, the the best thing here is for me just to keep my mouth shut, but then also produce a rating (laughs) for my show. Um, Because if you want to talk about Black Eyes, I mean, having a tribute, tribute show for... Benoit, and now that we've seen Dark Side of the Ring, we thought they didn't know until the next day, but apparently they knew before that the the Raw was going to air that... Really? Yeah, that Benoit did, you know, what he did. Yeah, so... That's why you'll never see footage of that Raw associated with the network or anything. That thing is just done. But, yeah, now Vince comes out, SmackDown, you know, pop, pop a rating. Uh, and I think the, you know, I s- was doing something else. And the next thing that I see is uh, the sand, uh, the little rascal that used to be Pete Dunn. What's going on with Pete Dunn? Oh, I, have... I refuse to call him whatever his name is now. Butch. <sighs> Wasn't there a Bushwhacker named Bush? There was <laughs> Bushwhacker, Butch, and Luke. So they're not even creative when creating the name because we already have WWE Hall of Famer Butch from the Bushwhackers. Yep. And as I said before, when we didn't record this podcast, uh, <laughs> Pete Dunn, ring technician, could go like 30 to 45 minute matches in NXT and put on five star matches. And now you got him running around, jumping tables, hopping over, uh, escaping, <laughs> running away, guessing that he's in Vegas and New York City and all this bullshit. Uh, the only good that's come from Butch so far is when he jumped the table and attacked Xavier Woods because that was just fucking hilarious. But yeah. I I don't know. I, it's He's another example that guys that come up from NXT are guaranteed to just be made fools of on the main roster. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I guess, part the reason why, like, Adam Cole left even though he was going to get a kajillion dollars to stay. Apparently, they wanted Adam Cole to be a manager. Like, the the current spot that um, L.A. Knight's character is was going to be the Adam Cole character. Wow, thank God he left. Yeah, what's, what's the new L.A. Knight name? Max Strauss or some shit like that? <laughs> <laughs> Something Dupree. Max Dupree. Max Dupree. Du- Max Strauss is like an athlete. Yeah. That plays the sports ball. 
I I don't I honestly they take it, it, I've always said this it's like whoever's good in NXT that you think is good and it's going to make like like light the world on fire don't put any money in investing in that person because when push comes to shove it's always going to be the the person from NXT that was like the mid card person for whatever reason comes up to the main roster and actually does a lot more case in point people like Elias in theory. Yeah. Like Elias did absolutely nothing in NXT. He comes to WWE. He disappeared for a bit because he was injured like recently. But before that, he's been a featured player. Then you have someone like Theory, who in NXT, he was always the lackey for someone else. Uh-huh. Gargano. Now, now well, even like even before that, he was on uh when he was made his main roster debut, he was the lackey for Seth brief, you know, briefly when Seth had his little group. But I remember saying to people with Theory, I'm like, that's Vince's wet dream right there. Like that's the kind of look that he he wants for his wrestlers and he I, I think he's like the chosen one I wouldn't be surprised within the next 12 months he does win the big belt I could see it I mean he's just been incredible I think so far in his role. I mean, he's really done a, a great job. Uh, SmackDown. All I can say is WWE is really predictable. I mean, I haven't really watched a SmackDown in probably like a month. Um, and we still have Mad Cat Moss and Corbin feuding. When does the- that was the last laugh match, though? Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> So SummerSlam, it looks like we're probably going to get Pat back. McAfee back in the ring against Corbin. Um, yep. These two actually are really good friends outside of the ring. Uh, they were teammates in training camp for the Colts in 2009. They shared a room together, and they've been friends ever since, kept in touch. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if they put the real life friendship story in the WWE storyline. So I'm actually kind of hyped to see it. Um, Pat McAfee, he's been a revelation. I think a lot of people that didn't see the NXT Pat McAfee, and you know, all of a sudden he was the announcer on SmackDown. They're like, "What is this dude doing on SmackDown?" I think he's universally beloved amongst the the fans with his commentary. Now his in ring work, um, and you yeah. can tell he's got a real passion for wrestling and the WWE. Which I don't think it came out with some of the other guys like Jimmy Smith on Raw. That dude is the most boring announcer. <laughs> He is horrible. And then remember they had, I think they had him for like four or five weeks. They had Adnan Verk or one of those guys. Who? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But who? Adnan Verk from like MLB. That must have been when I wasn't watching Raw. I, I think that was around the time McAfee got hired. They had Verk and then Verk got replaced by Jimmy Smith. And I was like, can we just have uh, Mac if he on Raw and SmackDown? Graves, too. Graves should be on Raw and SmackDown as well. Uh, I think they arranged that because of Carmella and everything, right? Yeah. But it's it's funny how they would, it would always uh, screw over the Usos with Naomi. They would always be on like separate shows. Yeah. Um. Yeah, man. So, it, when it comes to 
SmackDown, I guess, the, the, the second biggest thing that came out of it was uh, after a really, really good match between Riddle and um, I was going to say Brock Lesnar. Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns. Uh, we get the return of Brock, which I'm always I'm happy to see Cowboy Brock. I am not happy to see Cowboy Brock and Roman for the what third time in the last year and fifth time in six years. Yeah. And they've already done enough of the storyline already where nothing will shock me. Like Heyman's turned on one person, Heyman's turned on the other person. Like, what can they do to make this any bigger? And when we recorded, well, when we didn't record the last episode, we were just <laughs> shooting the shit, apparently. Um, we came up with, well, you you came up with Seth winning Money in the Bank. He, which he absolutely will. And then I'm like, wait, the main event for SummerSlam is Brock and Roman. And the last time Seth had the money in the bank and he cashed in the main event match that he cashed in on was Brock and Roman. Brock and Roman. So I I think we're going to get a cash in and they're going to make it some sort of cash in we have never seen before. Like something's going to happen where he either gets one bell, he gets to choose the title the contract in there is only says they get one championship, not both championships, because they want to split off the championships again. Um, Let's unify the titles for five months. That'll and that show. Way, and that way, Roman can still have you know the SmackDown Universal title, and Seth can have his WWE title. And eventually when Cody comes back and wins the Rumble, then we can have Cody and Seth for the fourth time for the, the title. Because to me, for Cody to win the the title that his father didn't win, it, it shouldn't be the universal title. It has to be the WWE title. I get it. They get both belts with it. But to me, what signifies him fulfilling the dream, right? No pun intended, is to actually win the WWE title. In ship. Yeah. Um let's talk about AEW. Let's... <laughs> now you've known me a long time. You know I've been a big supporter of AEW. Would it shock you to know? And pretend like we didn't, you know, try to record last time. Would it <laughs> shock you to know that I haven't watched AEW for almost a month? If I hadn't known what I already know, yes, it would shock me. Yeah, so I have watched for nearly a month now. And there's a couple of reasons why. One of which is, I, I think without Cody, they're missing someone that was willing to put anyone over. Also, Russell, a great match. And, like, his presentation was always, like, a star presentation. Like, superstar presentation. When I watch AEW, not a lot of them are presented as stars. Even CM Punk, to me, is not presented as a star. Like, Cody had the entrance coming up and the pyro and all this stuff. No one else really gets that kind of shine in the UW. Second, their storylines, they go nowhere. They absolutely go nowhere. And whenever they do a long-term storyline, something happens where it gets botched along the way. Case in point, Hangman Page and Omega. It took them entirely too long to pull the trigger on Hangman winning the title. By the time he won the title, he was cold. Granted, his wife gave birth. 
But Tony Khan knew his wife was pregnant. He should have won the belt earlier. He wins the title. He defends it three or four times. He's off TV, actually, a bunch as champion. And then now he lost it to Punk. And now he's back to the Hangman page that we saw prior to him winning the title. It did absolutely nothing to elevate him. Uh, At one time, I I mean, call me crazy, I was thinking that dude was the next uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin. That's how popular he was. They waited too long to pull the trigger. He's cold. Then every, it seems like every three to five weeks, AEW decides to sign a new free agent, implement them, and then forget about them. Malachi okay. Black, Andrade, Keith Lee, or they just have really bad storylines for them. It took almost a year to get Christian away from Jurassic Express. Why? <laughs> a, a year. Double, uh, what was it, all out last year, right? What was the main event? What was the main event match of of that pay-per-view? It was Omega versus Christian for the AEW championship. Mm-hmm. Could you imagine Christian in an AEW championship match right now? Absolutely not. Okay. That's my point. Signing these people and doing fantasy booking is great. I'm all about fantasy matches, but when you're running a weekly TV show, less is more sometimes. So having all these people on the roster is actually hurting them. It is becoming very much like a couple of other companies. It's becoming like WCW, towards the tail end of WCW. And it's mm-hmm. becoming like Impact when Impact just went out and signed a bunch of WWE guys, a bunch of the high priced indie guys. Or they went out. Remember, Impact also did the thing with uh, Tito Ortiz. Yeah. Like, I'm all about building partnerships, but they only have two hours of live TV a week. For storylines, and you 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 keep, don't how much into that? Yeah, you keep flooding, and and I love wrestling, but I don't have time to sit there and watch AEW Dark on YouTube. I really don't. And they have storylines that take place on Dark, and then all of a sudden <laughs> that storyline comes on Dynamite, and you're like, and they don't explain what happened on Dark. And they're like, yeah, this is the match, and this came out of Dynamite. I mean, this came out of Dark, and I'm like, well, I don't watch Dark, so I have no idea what happened. And, I mean, the ratings are proof that they're a flat product. They average between 850 and 950,000 people. I mean... This Raw is getting what? Around 2 million. Right? In, in ratings, obviously, the ratings for everything have, have gone down because of streaming services, yeah, uh, DVRs, uh, all that. But WWE still doubles the audience with a product that isn't that great and a roster that really isn't that great. The roster that AEW has is better than WWE's roster. Overall, it's a better roster. You could do a lot more with it. The tag team division alone is crazy. FTR, the the Bucks, Lucha Bros, the Hardys. Well, <laughs> well yeah, you, you, <laughs> not so much anymore. Well, Jeff will, Jeff will come back. He's got nine lives. He'll come back. Um. It's just, to me, 
nothing's worth investing with them. I'm, I was I was on the Wardlow hype train. He squashes at MJF at double or nothing. And then he's feuding with 20 security guards. Yeah. Mark Sterling. And then you have the Forbidden Door pay-per-view where CM Punk, obviously, uh, he, he gives up the title but doesn't give up the title. So now we're going to have an interim champion. And they have the Moxley as the number one contender. Then they have the Battle Royal. Why couldn't they have just had Wardlow win the Battle Royal and beat Moxley? Because they're afraid to push homegrown? It's not like the ratings have increased that much with all the big signings, though. Mm. The only one that made an impact initially was Punk. No one else has moved the needle to get their ratings over what the first episode of Dynamite did when it debuted. Which is crazy. Yeah. It shows that they're only catering to the niche fantasy booking audience. The people that subscribe to Wrestling Observer and want Dave Meltzer five to seven star matches. Me, I enjoy a good wrestling match, but I enjoy the storylines just as much. Absolutely. You have, you have to give me something to invest in. Like WrestleMania 12, right? Iron Man match, HBK mm-hmm. versus Bret Hart. That match, I mean, we didn't know that they hated each other. I actually, I don't think they hated each other yet, but the buildup was the boyhood boyhood dream versus the veteran champion. As mm-hmm. basic and as simple as it sounds, that was the storyline. And how did they build that storyline? Well done vignettes where Bret Hart was in Calgary training. Then you had HBK training in Texas with Jose Lothario. Yep. Right? And it was a simple and basic storytelling of how hard they have to train for a 60-minute match. And then they go out there and they do that 60-minute match. AEW is not doing this. AEW does not understand long-term booking. They think Julia Hart getting the mist in her eyes and then review- <laughs> and then seven months later, finally having her join House of Black is long-term storytelling. No, it's just... You delayed the inevitable. That's what you did. It's not smart booking. You're actually just annoying the audience and you're you're thinking that your audience is stupid. Basically, when you're saying, oh, now we're finally going to have her join House of Black, even though everyone knew she was going to join House of Black. I mean, what can Tony Khan do, Charlie? Like, what can he do to improve AEW? Focus on homegrown talents uh, instead of the guys he's already given the champion. Well, he gave it to Adam Page, but focus more so on homegrown talents, the pillars of uh, AEW. Um, Because like we were saying before, if this all happens and they give the championship back to a Kenny Omega or a Chris Jericho or... Uh, John Moxley, that's just going to be wa- go- going b- backstepping, backpedaling. We need new stars out of AEW. We need something to sink our teeth into. We need... I I don't know. I, I mean, I think bottom line is one person even doing two hours of live TV and an hour of Rampage, which is taped. One person should not be making decisions for an entire company. I get it. Tony Khan and his dad invested all this money in the company, but there is very creative people that could help him with storytelling and booking these events. And it's almost like he refuses to help. I mean, he says in interviews, like, oh, no, I listen to people's ideas. But you're not a... Like, 
they had EVPs, right? Remember that? Cody was an EVP. Yeah. Uh, the Bucks, Kenny. Uh, they basically got rid of all those positions. Really? Yeah. So Tony Khan is running everything. It just seems like, I hate to say it, like, I remember there was a lot of negativity when AEW first came out, and I was like, well, wait, this is a good thing. And it still is a good thing for the wrestling business that AEW exists, and I want it to exist. But it does seem like the money mark comments that were made about Tony Khan are true. It's literally like, Charlie, I gave you a bunch of money to, you know, your, your dad had a bunch of money to buy a wrestling company. And he said, son, you can start your own wrestling company. And that that's how you would book AEW. Like, that's how the the casual niche fan is going to book it. And that's how he has. Mm-hmm. Name me one storyline that AEW has had where you're like, man, that was a great storyline that didn't involve MJF. <laughs> if it didn't involve them, Jeff, I can't. Or Cody. I can't. Okay. So that leads me to my second, well, third thing. Pay that, pay MJF money. Pay him whatever he wants. Because right now, out of everyone you have on the roster, that man's your biggest star. And if you don't see that, then you should just sell AEW and get out of the wrestling business. Absolutely. He's not the best wrestler in the world. He's the best talker. And he's the best at telling a story. Granted, he's had some good dancing partners. But you need that. Any storyline needs that. Uh, I would be frustrated if I was him. Every feud that he's been in, even though he's got a victory here or there, he's ultimately lost every feud that he's been in. Whether it's Punk, Wardlow, Jericho, etc. He has lost every major program, Moxley, every major program. Gives him to be frustrated. But yet he's considered one of the pillars. Yeah. And I almost feel like what CM Punk said was the truth. When he said to MJF that Britt Baker has replaced you on the pillars, I I honestly think there was a lot of truth to that. The way that Tony has pushed Britt Baker and not actually pushed MJF to where he can ultimately go. That it, if WWE gets MJF, he will instantly be their biggest heel they've ever had in the last 15, 20 years tops. Maybe ever. He just has a different... He's unique. There's no one like him. I I forget who said this. I think it was Jim Ross was like, MJF reminds him if Paul Heyman wrestled. Wow. Spot on. Yeah. And I thought about him like, yeah, no, that's that's highly accurate. Um do you think MJF's gonna leave? Like do you think it's in in the cards here? Do you think like that whole run up runoff with double or nothing and Missing the autograph appearances, like, was that a work? Was it a shoot? Was it both? What do yes. you think? Um, I see. I'm torn because he's a reason for me to watch AEW, but I would love to see him over in WWE. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he's definitely fishing right now to see what offers he gets. And I think he could easily get out of an early contract instead of waiting until 2024 when his contract is up. Uh, 
I don't want him to be miserable and stay in AEW and need to stay till 2024 if he could get out and go where the grass is greener, so to speak. Uh, I think he would work wonders in WWE. And maybe I'm just being biased because I'm a WWE guy, but I think he would work absolute wonders in WWE. And can you imagine him and Cody in WWE? No. Like, them actually having a feud together in WWE, they would no, be bigger but... yeah, than the one they had in AEW. There's, as much as I don't want to admit it, WWE is where you want to go if you're a wrestler. If you don't want to go to WWE at some point in your career, there's something wrong with you. You can't tell me that your dream is to work in AEW. Especially how it is right now. I think I think there are a lot of people out there who, who would say their dream is to work in AEW right now. They're fools. Look, a lot of the people that weren't used, it's not like they're getting they were getting paid a ton of money. Joey Janela makes more money GCW than he did in AEW. Really? Mm-hmm. Wow. Even though I don't really like him as a person. I'm just... It's a fact. A lot of those lower card people in AEW, they, do, they don't make a lot of money. That's why I'm saying it, it reminds me a lot of WCW and TNA. Where they bloated the rosters so much, and they they held people, which WWE did up until when Nick Khan came and said, "Wait a minute, how many people do we have under contract? We have two hundred and fifty wrestlers under contract." And they boom, mass release, mass release. Great people lost their jobs. Like it's never, but we're just talking business, like. These people were sitting, not doing anything. In many cases, them being released was probably a better thing for them in the long run. Um, yeah, but no, MJF, in my opinion, if he doesn't wrestle the rest of the year, he's still up for wrestler of the year for me. That's fair. He, and he's done... Everything that you could want. You know how many people bought Double or Nothing just because of the controversy that were going that was going on that day. Mm -hmm. Oh my god! I mean, I was on the fence about buying it, but as soon as this whole thing came out, I'm like, "All right, I gotta tune in." And I knew my, and I knew in my heart of hearts, I'm like, if he shows up, he's just gonna get squashed, and that's exactly what happened. Yep. I don't know. Tony Khan needs to, you know who, you know what Tony Khan needs to do? He needs to find his Pat Patterson. He needs to find that person that he actually respects their ideas and go, and that person's like just super knowledgeable and goes, you know, it'd be a good idea, this Royal Rumble thing I thought of or whatever. Yeah. Like AEW, it seems like they have a ladder match, a hardcore match. Uh, every week, there's there's nothing that's unique that that I go, man. This is a AEW original. This this makes me tune in to AEW. The Casino Battle Royals. They're basically like what TNA used to do. They they don't have their signature match yet. No. Everything that they do is a is a, a stadium stampede. Is the only thing I can think of that there's that that is their own, and they can't do that all the time. War games, so yeah, I don't. They need to come up with something, and they need to to get 
Well, well, Tony Khan just needs to get someone that he trusts to help him with creative. It you can't have a new wrestler debut every week and expect that to fix your issues. No. Um. Well, we we didn't touch on this at all, but Jeff Hardy. And that's what started off this crazy week in wrestling. We thought that that was going to be like it for this week, but nope, there's more. Yeah, no, I DUI, DW, what was it, DUI? DUI. He looked out of it, according, you know, I saw the footage. He looked not in the best of shape. And it's sad because it was sad watching him at double or nothing. It's sad knowing that and I put this on Tony Khan as well just because someone says that they don't have a problem doesn't mean that they don't have a problem and they shouldn't have signed him to begin with knowing how he left WWE they should have waited a longer time to see how he was before yeah. signing him Absolutely, um, because I get it. People are unhappy and want and quit their job. Case in point, me. You know, I left my job beginning of the month, right? But overall, it's you know, I, I don't have a drug problem. I don't have an addiction. But there's with Jeff Hardy that he has this history that's followed him with his demons and WWE knows him so well that they called him out on it. He didn't like it. And he basically left and got his release. Then Tony Khan goes, Oh, you know what would be great? We're going to have this guy dive off of ladders, 30 foot ladders through tables into chairs. I, I mean, I, I don't get it. I don't I don't get it. Um over the weekend when I had went to the wrestling con, the Hardys were actually there on the Saturday doing an autograph session. So that's basically one of his, you know final appearances before the um his arrest. And I saw a picture of him with a, a fan and I'm like, I don't know, man. I don't know if he's in the best of health. Like, that's why I thought to myself. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's hope that, you know, he gets himself the help that he needs um, and stays on the right path. I mean, it's, it's very hard um, when you have these demons. Like, if you're an alcoholic and a drug addict, you're always an alcoholic or a drug addict, even if you're not using like that's what you are. Yeah. Um so like uh, you know prayers go out to him and his family and I'm sure you know it's been tough on his family all these times that he's put them through this too. When is enough going to be enough though? You thought when he had kids he was going to clean up. You thought you know like what's going to what's going to be it for him? I mean, I hate to say this, like, a, oh, I would say, like, a Lamar Odom type incident happens to him where he is, like, in a coma and, like, has the come to Jesus moment that happens to him. And I don't think, you know, obviously that hasn't happened to him or something he does but someone else's life at risk. And you would think that would have been the whole thing with Sting when he came out inebriated at bound for yeah. what was it whatever tna pay-per-view it was and you know he could have injured sting or sting could have injured him but it's literally going to take a near-death thing for for jeff hardy to want to be clean once and for all and it's unfortunate but i think that's where he's at at this time yeah um we have Sasha Banks, no longer in WWE, potentially. Um, 
another one, you know, it's weird how we say, you know, MJF would be better in WWE, but yet Sasha Banks is released by WWE. We want to talk about a star. The moment I saw Sasha Banks, I said, that girl's a star. And with each passing year that I saw Sasha Banks, she's a star. But I feel like WWE never, ever saw her as the star that I would say a lot of people and a lot of fans thought of her as. In case in point, her booking, uh, she would always lose her title or the belt, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, yeah, after the winning it. Yeah, the first, the first defense every single time. She was always the plus one to, you know, Bailey or whoever else. Uh, John Favreau watched WWE just, you know, perusing through the television channels, stopped, goes, who is that? That girl looks like a star. And cast her on a, on a little-known show, The Mandalorian. Yep. If Hollywood... <laughs> can look at Sasha Banks and call her a star. Why isn't she booked as a star? Is it because she's vocal about the way that she's booked? Is it something else? Like, what do you, what do you think? Like, what do you think the problem was with Sasha as compared to the booking that Charlotte gets, Becky gets, Bailey got, etc.? I think that Sasha, I, I don't understand why she was booked so poorly. She's a natural born talent. Um, out of the four horsewomen, she's the most talented, as we were saying before. Uh, a lot of it is namesake for Charlotte. I, I think that's fair to say. Uh, she's, she's a workhorse, but a lot is given because of the flair name. Um, Bailey, Bailey deserves everything she gets. You can't take that away from Bailey. Uh, Becky Lynch too, but for whatever reason, they see Sasha Banks, Sasha Banks in fourth place out of the four horsewomen, and I couldn't tell you why. So unpopular opinion, or it, it may be a popular opinion, you know, we have, when we post this on YouTube, I'm sure we'll get some comments. The four horsewomen, my, the one that I think, and I'm not saying any of them are bad, but the one that I just don't particularly care about all that much is Becky. That's an unpopular opinion, but <laughs> an opinion nonetheless. But I think she's horrible on the mic. She's okay in the ring. She got over with the man thing. And that was it. There's not one time besides that eight, eight or nine month little run there where I'm like, man, I see her as a star. I don't see her as a star. Really? I think, no, I think all she did was Conor McGregor gets is very popular for just saying outlandish things in an Irish accent because I'm and I'm Irish, so I'm gonna copy what he does on WWE television to make myself get over. And then in the process of her getting over, she's also slammed people. <laughs> it, it, it's I don't know. I just don't I. Her gimmick is just a really just a stolen. That man gimmick was a stolen gimmick. Now I don't even know what her her gimmick is like a uh, a heel from the nineteen eighties. A cowardly heel. How do you go from the man to a cowardly heel? That's that's true. That's fair. I don't know. She bitches a lot on the mic, but that's her character. But 
I don't know. When, when she was the man, she didn't. No. Okay. Yeah. Point proven. <laughs> <laughs> I'll admit what I'm wrong. Uh, I guess one of the things that um, is coming up that I'm not looking forward to at all is the Forbidden Door. That 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 pay per view is going to end up being probably the worst one in the history of AEW. It's just not what you expect when you hear that it's going to be New Japan versus AEW. You you think like all star matches, and yet we have Orange Cassidy and Will Ospreay. Between injury, between contracts not allowing people to work with New Japan. It's a cluster. When AAA is getting involved in saying, Andrade, you can't work that match against Osprey because he works for New Japan, there's something wrong with the language in these AEW contracts and allowing them to work outside of AEW. Like, if AAA doesn't allow uh, their workers to work when in New Japan, AEW shouldn't be hiring anyone from AAA, though in their relationship with New Japan. Then you have someone like Okada losing the belt because apparently he didn't want to lose the belt to someone in AEW or have a chance of losing the, <laughs> losing the belt to someone in AEW. It's a t- It means nothing. The belts mean nothing. Okada, you're already established. You're the biggest star in the Dave Meltzer wrestling world. You, you give five to seven star matches. You, you would be the biggest star in AEW if you wanted to be the biggest star in AEW. Because that's who AEW caters to. They don't cater to anyone else besides the, the, the niche wrestling fans. That's why they only draw 900,000 viewers every week. Jeff, they have people on this card that I don't even know. Then their main event for the AEW interim title is Moxley and Tanahashi. I'm pretty sure they've wrestled each other before. So we're not seeing anything new. And Moxley wrestled in Japan for what? was like a year? Mm Mm-hmm. You're not giving me anything new. You know who I wanted to see? Danielson. Yeah. That would have been good. I guess the the big money match is the Jay White, Cole, and Hangman match. That's the That's technically I would I would say probably their main event. But it would look so much better if they had Okada in there. In instead, they're going with Moxley. Moxley and Tanahashi is for the interim AEW. The That's IWGP yeah, is the um the title that Okada had, but then he lost it to Jay White. So now it's Jay White. Yeah, with, but the Moxley match is going to play out the pay per view, right? I would assume it depends on the agreement that AEW and New Japan have. Yeah. Do they want to put the New Japan title over as being a bigger title than AEW or vice versa? Like, does does one of those matches open the show? Oh, geez. <laughs> they, they booked themselves into a corner and CM Punk being hurt, it just came at the wrong time. You, you give him the oh, belt. Definitely. It, it irks me, considering I guess we would have got Punk and Tanahashi. Most likely. Wouldn't the dream match if we were doing fantasy booking? Because this is what this event's made for, is for fantasy booking, right? So 
the whole conversation that I said about storytelling, like it's out the window for this pay-per-view. So if you want to book a pay-per-view for fantasy booking, this is the pay-per-view to do it. Wouldn't the fantasy booking be Punk and Okada? Yeah. But then you can do like, I would do a triple threat. I would do a bunch of triple threats. I'd do a triple threat Moxley versus Brian Danielson versus Tanahashi. Throw those three together. You could still do the Jay White triple threat with Cole and Hankman. It makes sense. They're all Bullet Club members Mm -hmm. together. Which I don't know how that match is going to play out considering that Jay White and Cole are like teammates. But but yet, it's going to be a triple threat match. But I don't know. I mean, it took like I said, it took almost a year for Christian to turn uh, to turn heel on a dinosaur in a in a freaking <laughs> man child. <laughs> While he sat there, literally, Christian had what? He probably wrestled twice in the last year, three times. <laughs> Remember when he came to to uh, AEW? They're like the biggest free agent signing yep. ever in the his in the history of wrestling. And I was like, you know what? I was like, Christian is good. I was like, he's damn good. Uh, I mean, we have uh, a mutual friend that hates him, but <laughs> that was just I mean, like... the guy came came off of a Royal Rumble appearance where he was in the final three or four people, right? Uh, you sign him. He hasn't wrestled in a long time. People were interested in seeing him work again. And you slow build him to Omega. And by the time you get to Omega, you've already signed seven or eight people who have bigger names than Christian. So no one wanted to see Christian and <laughs> Kenny Omega double or nothing. And it's unfortunate. Like, deep down, Christian probably regrets not signing the WWE contract. Yeah. That makes sense. Him and Edge could have just ran rough shot over everyone. They could have had a feud. They could have been back together. They could have had another feud. He's with a dinosaur and a man-child. Why are we still talking about AEW? I don't know. It just makes me <laughs> upset. Well, with that being said, is there anything else that we didn't talk about? We didn't talk about SmackDown this time through, did we? Yeah, we did. We, we Mon- said that we said that Riddle and Roman was yeah. the match. Money in the Bank. Sheamus. Andrew. Andrew. Well, because it does. To me, this is why Cesaro hasn't signed with any wrestling. Because uh, they're all fucked up. <laughs> He's playing it smart. He's just waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, same thing with Bray Wyatt. Like he's just gonna wait till. WWE is desperate enough to just throw him a bag of money. Yeah. The guy still sells merch for them, and he hasn't been in the company for almost a year. Wait, he's still selling merch for them? Well, I'm saying his merch is still on their website. Oh, shit. He was their number, like, <laughs> one of their top merch movers. I, I don't know, man. It's, it's uh, it's disappointing to see how a company like I'm just gonna get back to it. How AEW started off like, like it was gonna be the biggest thing ever to being what what it is now. Like nothing has changed. Yeah, so we're gonna deliver realism. We're gonna deliver storylines. We're gonna deliver that, and they haven't delivered on a single.
at least with WWE, I know that they're they're gonna give me false promises. <laughs> <laughs> We're used to that. We're used to that. Not fair when new people come in and offer us false promises. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It, it sucks too. Uh, getting back to SummerSlam because I guess it was going to be Orton and Reigns. Yeah, that would have been good. I mean, he would have Orton would have lost, but that's the problem that they're in. Who, who's going to be? Roman, it has to be a Seth Cashin. It hundred percent has to be a Seth Cashin. Seth, Seth is hundred percent, and Seth is going to cash in at SummerSlam. And Seth and Roman might even have a little mini feud somewhere, and oh. hopefully not for the titles because I don't want to see the titles unified again. It just makes more sense to have belts on each show. It just, why ever unify them? Five months. Five months. That's why. Yeah. So they, they sucker us in. Oh, this is a unification match. <laughs> this is the last time we're ever going to see this. Better watch. How many times have they advertised this is going to be the greatest match ever in the last, like, three years? Of course. Years? It, we're fiends for this. I mean, I've been watching since I was like five, so thirty-one years of watching. I'm not gonna stop. I mean, I'm obviously I stopped for a little bit, but I'm never gonna completely stop watching. Yeah, and because of this show, I have to watch now. So, <laughs> ha ha. <laughs> you With that being said. Um, again, I'm JML. This is Charlie. Charlie uh, also has a other show that he's on called Scholars of Wrestling, um, which usually they have a video or their shows come out over the weekends. So it's usually look for it on Saturday or Sunday. And thank um, you for giving me the permission to go on and do this. Yeah. Yep. We thank them, and they're more than welcome to come on with us, or vice versa, to uh, discuss the happenings of the wrestling biz. Um, it's all in good fun. Um, also, again, 200 subscriber, 300 comment giveaway across our videos. We should have a another video up on Tuesday uh, reviewing Raw, and we'll just have casual conversation of whatever else is going on. Sounds good to me. And then Thursday we'll have a, a dynamite. <laughs> Whoopee! We'll have a dynamite <laughs> show. Um, which will be interesting because maybe 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 someone from AEW listens to this little unknown uh, chamber pod from Parts Unknown podcast and uh, you know, they get their shit together. We're going to get reamed by AEW fans. Uh, we are, but keep in mind, 99% of my wrestling shirts are all AEW shirts. So I have an <laughs> AEW blanket. I have an AEW pillow. <laughs> so I'm just upset with the company right now. Um. And I and I think they're talented. They have a talented roster. There's just a lot of things that need to be fixed with them. So, with that being said, um, we're going to sign off. Good night and good luck. <laughs>